Today on Truck Tech, we add a little bit of mid-90s flair to this early 2000s GMC. I might be crazy, but I just think it might work. Let's talk about popular trends for a moment. Now, I'm not talking about fashion, shoes, jeans, any of that. I mean, obviously, you guys have seen how I dress. I am not up on the most current fashion trends. But let's talk about trucks. If you go to a popular truck show, maybe SEMA or something like that today, you look around, you're gonna see bigger, badder. Everything is giant. Wheels, 24, 26 inches. It's kind of almost the standard nowadays. You know, lift kits, you've got nine inches, 14 inches, sometimes on air ride. Just, it's all about being big, being outlandish. Now let's talk about old school trucks for a second. Let me take you back. This is kind of to when I was in middle school and high school in the mid 90s. If you had a big tire, well guess what? You were rolling on 33, 12, 50, 15s. You know, I'm talking roll bar in the bed with the yellow lights on top. Those are some things that were way cool back in the day. But as trends do, they come and then they go. So it's been a long time since I've seen a truck that's had a roll bar bolted in the back. Now I will know that it is becoming popular again because that's another thing that happens with trends. They're cyclical, they come and they go. In fact, if you browse social media, one thing I've noticed, you see a lot of small wheels that are coming back into play. You know, it's now all of a sudden cool again to be running like a 16 by 12 old school wheel. It's time for a new project here at Truck Tech. In fact, I'm sitting in it right now. So let me show you what I picked out. Now, I suppose the logical choice for a mid 90s throwback build would be a mid 90s truck, but we've seen that before. I wanted to see the mid 90s treatment on an early 2000s truck, and that's why I picked a 2002 GMC Sierra 1500. Now, this is probably one of the most popular used trucks on the market to this day. They made literally millions of these things, and ours has 250,000 miles on it, but that's okay because it runs great. Now, as far as the condition it's in, this is about as original as they come. The three most popular modifications, wheels, exhaust, and intake, all bone stock. So this truck is basically a time capsule. The interior, considering its age, is in really great shape, so this is a perfect blank canvas to start our retro build. Now, as far as my initial impressions of this particular truck, it's a classic GMC, and it drives, I mean, basically like a nearly 20-year-old truck should drive. It's got a few clunks in the front end, definitely a few loose parts here and there. So we'll address that along the way. But as far as power goes, I mean, these little 5.3s, they actually do really well. They're reliable. I mean, they'll last forever. And it's pretty spunky for being a stock truck with 258,000 miles on the odometer. So we'll rebuild the front end. We'll tighten things up there, get rid of some of the looseness, some of the play. That's fairly basic standard operating procedure when you drive a truck that's nearly 20 years old. Take care of some of the problems and we'll give this truck a new lease on life. So let's get back to the shop. Let's get started. When I originally came up with a scheme to put a roll bar in the bed of this pickup, I wasn't actually sure if I could even find one new. I figured worst case scenario either I had to go to a junkyard, find an old one and get it either replated or repainted, or I would just build one out of stainless steel exhaust tubing. But luckily they actually still make them, so we picked one up. Now we did get it from Summit Racing because they have such an extensive line of truck accessories and this is a Go Rhino bed bar. Now they make this in black or chrome which for me is the obvious choice if we're doing a mid 90s style of build and it's a double single. Basically what that means there are two main bars and a pair of kickers that go down the back. 
Now this is designed to resemble an off-road full roll cage, but it's just a stylistic upgrade. There's actually no collision or rollover protection that this will afford you, but it looks great and I can't wait to get it in. Later on, we'll show you how to extract a broken bolt without damaging your cylinder head. But up next, nothing says throwback like retro lighting. We're adding a little mid-90s throwback styling to our extended cab GMC with this chrome bed bar, and it's very simple to assemble. The tubes are sleeved so they can slide together, and a series of bolts hold it all in place. With the main double tubes connected with a spacer in between and everything tightened down, we get the whole thing into the bed of the Sierra. All right, Jimmy, so we're going for a bit of a retro vibe here. What do you think? Did we nail it? Uh, yes, I think you did. It screams 90s. Okay, good. I was gonna say, some people, some people think a little bit 80s or even 70s with a roll bar, but no. I this think is what did. I remember. Oh, you're on the little tow hook. There, there we go. go. I think you hit the nail on the head with this one. I like it. All right, man, well, I'm gonna let you get back to it. I can't wait to see till this thing's done because <laughs> this is a pretty good start. You know what, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I don't care, I like it. <laughs> cool, man. Thanks. Because this is a universal roll bar kit, all we've gotta do is get it centered in the bed and slid all the way forward, and then we can mark for placement of the holes. All right, we're drilling holes through the bed. So you gotta pay attention to where stuff is. In this particular truck, there's a gas tank that runs right along here. This is a really long drill bit. Now, you just can be careful, you shouldn't have any problems, but if you jam this thing all the way through, you might smell gas that starts to leak. So, just kinda take your time, you'll be all set. Simply bolting this chrome roll bar into the bed of our GMC makes it look three or four years older than it really is, but we can do better than that and backdate this truck all the way to the mid 90s with the proper choice of lighting. Now, if you're gonna go get some off-road lights for your vehicle today, you're probably gonna grab an LED light bar. They're fairly short, often wide, and they put out a ton of light, but they're very expensive and just would not look at home on our build. There's really only one choice, and that is a set of four KC Daylighters. Now, you've seen these things before. Probably the most iconic vehicle they're on is Bigfoot, but this is definitely a mid-90s statement. They're really bright. They come with these yellow plastic covers, which are intended to make them legal for driving on the street, because in a lot of jurisdictions, you actually can't have aftermarket lighting. So that's what the smiley face is for, and it makes me pretty happy too. So all we've got to do now is get this bolted to the light mounting bar and then we'll get everything bolted up to the roll bar. The light bracket is an optional extra, but it comes with the mounting holes pre-drilled, which makes installation of the lights a breeze. And the whole assembly can be attached to the roll bar with two bolts. Well, that is definitely Chuck Norris approved. While cosmetic upgrades are fine, it's time that we move on and install something that's actually gonna increase the performance of this truck. Because after all, something that looks good but is slow, it doesn't do anybody any good. Now, headers have been a popular modification for many years because they increase the performance of your engine by reducing the back pressure in the exhaust and increasing the scavenging effect, which essentially helps suck the exhaust out of the engine. Now, Summit Racing sells many different styles of header, from a direct bolt-in shorty to a mid-length to this, a long tube header. Now, these generally take a few more steps to install, but the longer primaries will help increase the scavenging effect, and a long tube usually has the greatest gains in horsepower out of any of the three styles that we listed. Now, this is also a ceramic-coated header, which means it's going to look this good pretty much the lifetime of the truck, but also it's gonna help contain some of the heat inside the exhaust system rather than letting it radiate out to the engine bay. Now, before I get these things installed, first I have to remove the manifolds and the rest of the exhaust system.
When it comes time to disconnect the exhaust system from the manifolds, I usually shy away from using a breaker bar or a ratchet because in my experience, the slow twisting motion that you get is much more likely to twist off the rusted bolts. Instead, I prefer to use something with just a little bit more oomph, like the Matco Tools Half Inch Infinium Cordless 20 Volt Impact. And this has 1600 pounds of breakaway torque from its brushless motor, but it also has a variable speed trigger which works for the delicate jobs as well as the heavy duty stuff. It's got a nylon reinforced composite handle, which means it's durable and lightweight, and it has a five amp hour battery with a built-in charge indicator, which lets you know exactly how much juice you've got left. There we go. Gotcha. Next, long tube headers will make our 5.3 breathe. It's a fact of life that engines can wear out. However, some are more prone to failure than others, like the 3.8 V6 found in JK Wranglers between 07 and 11. Now, if yours has bitten the dust, you could take it apart and send it off to a machine shop to get it rebuilt. But a quicker and usually more affordable option would be to pick up a remanufactured long block from Powertrain Products. It comes with graphite coated pistons, which will reduce cylinder bore wear, long lasting multi layer steel head gaskets, Viton valve stem seals, which will reduce the oil consumption problem that these are known for, and it even comes with an updated oil pump. Standard, you'll get a five year warranty, but that can be extended all the way out to seven. So if you need a long block for your JK or pretty much any vehicle, check out Powertrain Products. Today, the name of the game is getting a set of long tubes installed on our O2 GMC. And I've already got the passenger side exhaust manifold off. Now you can see these things certainly aren't the best looking and they are slightly restrictive, but here's a cool tech tip. If you guys are doing an LS swap or something with a turbo application, these exhaust manifolds, well, they're actually made from cast steel and not cast iron, which is useful because you can cut off these three bolt flanges and weld on a V-band or weld on a different shaped outlet to this exhaust manifold, for, like I said, a turbo application or what have you. But anyway, we got to get the driver's side exhaust manifold off of the engine. And I already just took a peek and there's a broken off bolt on the very front port. Now this is actually a little bit common on an LS application, especially in a pickup truck or a vehicle that's seen higher miles and a lot of heat cycles. Basically, as that fastener expands and contracts, as it gets warmer and cooler, it can fatigue and just crack and basically the heads will fall off. Like I said, it's a fairly common problem and I'll show you how to deal with it. But first, we got to get this manifold off the engine. I've seen guys try to fix these bolts, drilling them out, tapping them with like an easy out type situation. I've done that and it'll work, but it's time consuming and this is a little bit easier. Our 40 MIG welder is the ideal tool for the job since it can quickly build up material and get down into some harder reach places. I'll throw on some vice grips and the broken bolt quickly backs out. Well, all it took is one little glob welded on the end and we're able to back the bolt out. Now this works especially well on this situation, an aluminum cylinder head with an exhaust manifold bolt because the heat from welding actually helps soften up the thread locker that holds these in. And they're really not all that tight in the first place. You just need a way to kind of grab on and to back them out. So it's just one more way you can use a welder around the shop. Because the long tube headers are so much, well, longer than the stock exhaust manifolds, there's no way that they're going to easily connect to the factory mid pipe. So I cut off the excess and basically left this Y transition to merge two pipes into one. 
In the future, I do plan on running an aftermarket exhaust that bolts up to this flange right here. So for now, I'm just gonna leave the stock exhaust out back and this will just serve as a mounting location to hold everything in place while I fab up the middle section. The collectors have a three inch outlet and the Y pipe has a two and a half inch inlet and there's really no need to run three inch exhaust on an engine of this power level. So I'm gonna reduce down to two and a half inches right off the headers and on the driver's side, just make a quick 90 degree bend and it should shoot straight into the Y pipe. The passenger side should be even simpler because it's more or less a straight shot. I might need to jog it over to the left just a little bit, but it should be pretty simple. So I'll get started over here and I need about six or seven inches of pipe. My method for building a custom exhaust may seem a little bit unorthodox, but it works out pretty well for me. This is basically a game of connect the dots, and once the major components are mounted, all you've gotta do is fill in the gaps. I like to build small sub-assemblies at a time. Basically, I'll hold up one or two or possibly three bends at a time, mark for position, and then tack weld everything together over on the bench. Then I'll MIG tack the big chunks together underneath the truck so I know it's all going to fit perfectly and then remove the entire thing for finish welding over on the bench. And we'll take care of that next. It can be a little bit difficult to find a tire that'll work excellent off-road, but one that's also quiet enough to be driven comfortably when you're on the road. But the Grabber X3 from General Tire will do just that. It features a high void tread pattern with alternating shoulder lugs and multiple gripping edges, which will give you great traction in all kinds of terrain, sand, rocks, mud, or even just loose gravel. And the lugs on the sidewall, they'll provide extra protection and traction for when things get a little bit deep. The rubber compound will provide protection against cuts and gouges, and they're available in a wide range of sizes. Wheels between 15 to 22 inches, and the overall diameter goes up to 37. Overall, that header install actually went fairly smoothly. Yes, we did have a few roadblocks along the way, like having to extract a few bolts from the cylinder head and modify the Y pipe. But honestly, that's just par for the course when it comes to building trucks, especially if you start with an older one. Now, my favorite part about this install is the fact that it uses the factory flange back here. So if we wanna run the stock exhaust for a nice quiet kind of sleeper sound, we can do that. Or if we wanna to swap to an aftermarket dual exhaust for a little more rumble, well, that'll be super simple as well. So now the only thing we've got left to do is get this truck on the ground, start it up, check for leaks, and hear how it sounds. Well, it's nice and quiet, which means there are no leaks. Now, we're gonna fix that next time by adding an aftermarket exhaust, and we're definitely gonna give this thing a little bit more rumble, along with a few other upgrades that'll make this truck sit up in the air just a little bit and have a little more scoot when you put your right foot down. If you've got any questions about anything you've seen on the show today, be sure to check us out at PowerNationTV.com. Today on Truck Tech, we're gonna breathe some new life into our retro Sierra build by adding a posi rear end, dual exhaust, and rebuild the worn out front suspension. It's gonna be great. Today we're going to be spending a little more quality time with our 2002 GMC Sierra that's built in a throwback style. And last time we installed its centerpiece, the chrome double hoop roll bar with a set of four Casey highlighters on top. Now, well, last time we also installed a set of long tube headers to help this 5.3 put down just a little bit more power. But the exhaust system isn't done yet. 
We're also going to be installing a Flowmaster American Thunder dual exhaust kit. Now, I can't wait to hear how this 5.3 is going to sound with the Flowmasters and the long tubes, but before I get these dual tailpipes wrapped up and over the axle, there's something that I need to take care of inside the axle. So, first, it's time to get it up in the air. There are three main styles of differential that you'll find in a solid rear axle. Number one is an open differential. Now those are great for driving on the street, but pretty poor for performance driving because when you apply horsepower, usually only one wheel is gonna spin, which isn't great for accelerating. The second major style is a limited slip, and there are several subsets of limited slip, but they all work essentially the same way. Basically, there's some sort of a clutch mechanism inside that will distribute power between both rear wheels. So when you're on the gas, you'll spin both wheels. But when you're driving on the street, it will still allow for a difference of speed. So when you're cornering, you won't be chirping the tires and wearing them out prematurely. The third major set of differential is some sort of a locker or a spool. Now those provide great traction whether you're off-road or at the drag strip. However, when you're driving on the street, you're going to be chirping a tire, which can lead to handling problems, premature tire wear, and just a general annoying sound. Now, this particular type of truck, GM calls this differential a gov lock or a locking differential. But technically, it's not a locker, not in the traditional sense. It's more of a limited slip that can engage or disengage. Here's kind of how it works. On this cross shaft, there's a little counterweight that flips out as there's a difference in wheel speed. Now, centrifugal force will fling this thing out, and when the wheels are about 200 RPM difference, it'll catch on this little engagement plate, which forces out a wave plate, which engages a clutch pack, hence making it locking, but technically limited slip. Now, the nickname for this thing, like I said, is Gov Bomb, based on its nickname of Gov Lock, and that kind of gives you an idea of what happens. Basically, these small pieces, as the truck's mileage increases, or maybe it's seen some abuse, now, these little pieces can fling off and fall on the bottom of the case, but usually they don't go straight down. They'll get caught in between the ring and pinion. And when that happens, all sorts of carnage will ensue, and usually you have to replace everything inside the carrier. We don't want to have that happen, so we're going to replace this with something a little bit better. But we got to get started by pulling off the tires. While our first job of the day will be in the center of the differential, we first need to get the rear brakes out of the way so we can work with the axle shafts. With the center pin removed from the G80, the axles push in slightly and the C-clips can be fished out with the magnet. Aha, gotcha. Number one. And number two. Easy as that. Finally, we can unbolt the bearing caps and the stock carrier can be removed from the housing. Our GMC is equipped with an 8.6 inch 10 bolt rear differential with a 30 spline shaft. And for that application, Summit Racing sells just about every style of differential that we talked about. Lockers, spools, limited slip, and even an open. But the style that I chose was a traditional posi traction limited slip. Now this has clutch packs on either side of the spider gears, just like the G80. However, instead of a complicated mechanism, it just uses springs to apply constant pressure to the clutch pack, making that limited slip action work. Now this is the same style of differential that you'd find in your traditional old school muscle car that everyone loves from back in the day. And they work great for general all around performance driving. They work okay for mild off-roading and of course they're great for just doing burnouts with both back tires spinning. Now we don't need a master install kit because we're just going to be swapping out the carrier. So you can actually buy a carrier installation kit which comes with both bearings, a shim pack and 10 bolts to hold the ring gear onto the carrier. So the first thing I'm going to do is get the new bearings pressed on and we'll swap over the gear. Whether you use a shot press like ours or simply a hammer and a punch, it's always a good idea to push from the inner race of the bearing rather than on the rollers directly as to not cause damage. I've got the ring gear cleaned up and it slides onto the new posi. 
I'll apply some orange thread locker onto the bolts, which for this 10 bolt are left hand thread. They torque to spec at 65 foot pounds. We've got the new differential loaded up and we have no more worries about that old G80 exploding and taking out that 10 bolt. Now, the stock 373s on here are going to work great for what we have in mind, so there's no need to re-gear. And we could just slap this thing in and be good to go. However, there is a problem on the far outer end of the axle tube that I want to take care of first. A common problem on a higher mile truck is leaky axle seals, and ours are definitely letting out oil, and it's a simple repair. Once the seal is persuaded out of its home, and since we're here, I'm going to use a slide hammer to remove the old wheel bearings so we can replace those as well. Next, we need to do a little housekeeping to clean up all the oil and brake dust. The new bearing installs with an aluminum driver and a few taps for my hammer. And the oil seal follows suit. Next. How exactly does a posi track rear end work? It just does. I've got our 10 bolt axle assembly cleaned up, stripped down, the axle bearings are in along with the seals, and we're ready to start reassembly. Now, if you've never worked on a rear differential before, it can be a little bit intimidating, especially if you're going to change the gear ratio because there are a lot of parameters that you have to nail spot on. Otherwise, the rear end's going to run hot make a lot of noise and the gear set is going to wear out early. Now, because all we're changing today is the carrier, the only thing that we're going to have to adjust is carrier backlash. And that's controlled by shifting it further away from or closer to the pinion gear. And you've got to start somewhere just to get a baseline measurement. So I always throw in the stock cast carrier shims just to measure a baseline. And I make a handy little chart just to kind of see where I'm at. I've got 230 on the left, 245 on the right, which gives me the important number, 14 thousandths of an inch of backlash on the carrier. Now, that's not awful, but it's not acceptable either. On a 10 bolt like this one, we need somewhere between six to 10 thousandths of an inch. So I need to shift the carrier closer to the pinion, which means I gotta start stacking some shims. This system includes shims of five, seven, and 10 thousandths of an inch thick. So depending on how you stack them, you can make very fine adjustments. With my selection made, the carrier and shim stack goes into the housing and the caps are tightened up. So that was still quite a bit too loose. So I'm gonna take one of the 10 thousandths shims out of the stack that's on the right hand side and I'll switch it over to the left, which will shift the carrier over, and hopefully tighten up the backlash just enough. With a quick swap of one shim, I'll reinstall the carrier into the housing and once again, install the bearing caps. Now they say, if you're good, I'm not saying that I am, you can nail backlash just by the feel and sound. This one feels close, but let's find out for sure. Oh yeah. With the carrier sitting exactly where it should be, the axles can now slide back in. The C-clips are reinstalled along with the cross pin. Finally, it's time to seal this thing up for good with some Permatex Optimum Grade Gasket Maker. And the stock cover finishes the job. When I removed the rear brakes from our Sierra to take apart the axle, I noticed the pads were quite worn out. And in fact, one of them, the friction material had separated entirely from the backing plate. So it's time for a brake job because this is just plain unsafe. Now, EBC Brakes makes pads and rotors for a wide range of vehicles, just about everything that you'll see on the road. So for our GMC, I got a set of pads and rotors. The rotors are from their high carbon blade series, have these cool looking grooves in them, which will help remove a lot of heat and help them run cooler. And the high carbon alloy, that's gonna resist heat better. As far as the pads go, we chose their extra duty line, which are designed specifically for trucks and SUVs. And this is one of their longest lasting compounds, and it has a lot more grip than a OEM replacement does. Now, all told, this is going to make our GMC stop a lot shorter and be a lot safer than these old worn out pads that it came with. Well, since we're working on the back axle, that's where we'll get started. Also ahead, 
We'll give our 5.3 some rumble. Since we're building our GMC to be sort of like a throwback to a mid 90s truck, there's one thing it absolutely has to have dual exhaust. Now, we picked this up from Flowmaster, and it's one of their American Thunder exhaust kits, and it splits from a single exhaust up front to dual tailpipe. Now, you have the choice with this particular setup to either run the tips turned out to the side or straight out the back, which is what we're going to do. Now, this is their American Thunder kit, and it has a Super 40 muffler in the middle, and that's what's going to give this truck that iconic throwback rumble. I just can't wait to hear how this thing sounds. Now, the kit is made from 409 stainless steel, which means it's going to last a lifetime. And number two, it's going to bolt on easily because it uses all the factory hanger locations and there's no drilling or fabrication required. Now, before we get this thing on, though, we're going to get the old parts off. Now, I have been known to get just a little bit overboard when it comes to building an exhaust, especially if we have a situation where there's nothing readily available or off the shelf. Now, take Project Red Tide, for example. It was our 88 Chevy K1500 that started out life as a four-wheel drive truck. We lowered it down, converted it to all-wheel drive, and then put in an LS engine with a long tube header. So needless to say, there was no exhaust kit off the shelf that would fit the needs that we wanted to accomplish. So we started out and built a 100% custom stainless steel three-inch dual exhaust, complete with an X-pipe, dual tailpipes, and quad exhaust tips resembling a C5 Corvette. Now, as fun as that was, well, it took about four days of building, especially considering we have to make television, to get that exhaust done, fully welded, and installed. Now, if you're working at home, you don't want to spend four days on your back, on your floor, building a custom exhaust. And that's where the appeal of a bolt-on kit like this comes in. Everything is engineered to fit, it goes in the stock hangers, and it'll sound great, and you can do it in probably a half hour. Let's grab that muffler. Flowmaster Super 40 has a nice aggressive rumble without being overly loud or obnoxious. And it'll give this truck an unmistakable sound. Now with the tailpipes on this particular kit, there's a couple different ways that you could arrange them. I have them sort of set on an inboard arrangement because to me, it lines up nicely with the kickers of the roll bar that's in the bed. But if you prefer a more wide set look, you can do that as well, simply by loosening the rearmost clamp and twisting the last pipe 180 degrees. Or, of course, if you want a side exit, the kit also comes with that pipe, which will exit just on the lower part of the bedside. Again, it's totally up to you. Now, the exhaust is done, and we're ready to move on to the next job of the day, which is the front suspension. Our O2 Sierra has just under 260,000 miles on the odometer. But I'm really not too worried about the major mechanical parts because, well, these GM full-size pickups will pretty much last forever. But that doesn't mean you won't have to do the odd repair every now and again, especially in the front end. Now, in the future, we plan on running a little bit taller wheel and tire, and that's going to accelerate wear on some already worn out front end parts. So I just figured we'll get ahead of the curve and replace everything. Rock Auto offers replacement parts for just about any vehicle on the road, and there are different grades to choose from depending on your budget and application, whether that's economy, daily driver, or even heavy duty. Now, whenever possible, I prefer to grab preloaded control arm assemblies because of how much work it's going to save you. The lower bushings, ball joints, and shock mounts have already been pressed into position, and it's all painted so it's going to look good and last for a very long time. Now, these upper control arms is kind of neat because they're specific for a lifted application with the offset hole in the upper bushing, which is going to help that front end alignment get into spec. So we have everything we need. We just have to tear apart the old parts. Coming up, we'll put our posi to the test. Ah. 
An IFS, or independent front suspension, makes for a lot smoother ride and better handling than a solid front axle, which is found on some heavy-duty trucks. This is because when one side of the truck hits a bump in the road, the other side remains unaffected. The downside of IFS is there are a lot of moving parts which can wear out as the years go by, especially when larger tires are thrown into the mix. By swapping out the old control arms, we're going to be replacing eight bushings, four ball joints, and two shock mounts, all of which should restore the factory handling and ride quality. These old, rusted out, quarter million mile shocks are going to stay right here just for a little while longer. They're not going to stay for good. I have a new set coming with a leveling kit, and I'll get to that next time. But for now, the teardown is complete. The only thing that I found that I wasn't really anticipating was the CV axles. The outer boot on the driver's side was really torn up and all the grease had flung out and basically put a nice layer of greasy oil over everything in the front suspension and the joint was just a little bit worn. So I've ordered a new set of replacement CV axles for both sides, but I can still continue progress on the suspension and I get the A-arms bolted back into place. The rebuild starts with the torsion bar sliding through the control arm then lining up the bushings with the mount holes in the lower frame. Next, the shot goes back into place, which holds the suspension in position. The upper arm now goes in, and I'll set the alignment bolts to roughly midway through their travel. The spindle attaches to both the lower and upper ball joint, the castle nuts are torqued, and the cotter pin slides in, which keeps it from loosening up. Our new unit bearing assembly bolts onto the spindle, followed by the CV axle shaft which slides into position. A single nut secures it to the wheel bearing and six bolts hold it to the front differential. Done. The EBC rotor goes on, along with the caliper bracket, the brake pads, and finally the calipers. Last thing going on up front, is a new sway bar end link. With the suspension raised roughly halfway, I'll tighten the lower and upper control arm bolts. Finally, the torsion bar keys are reinstalled, which means this suspension job is complete. Well, that wraps up the rebuild of our front suspension, and you can more or less use these steps on any GM truck from 88 on up. And if you were paying attention, you'd probably notice that there were a couple of bolts that I didn't tighten up, mainly the ones that hold the control arms onto the chassis. Now, the reason I didn't tighten them up yet is because the suspension is drooped out. And wherever you tighten up a rubber bushing, it's going to get kind of tight and it'll bind as you try to twist it up or down. So I just prefer to tighten these when the suspension is at ride height. Now, normally that would require bolting the wheels on and putting the truck on the ground, but because I haven't indexed the torsion bars yet into the cross member, I can easily do it now with a pole jack. The new tires for our GMC have just arrived, and I chose a 305 70 on a small, by today's standards, 16 inch wheel for that old school look. Plus, it'll go along nicely with the raised white letters on the sidewall. This is a General Grabber ATX, and it's an all-terrain tire, which is going to work great on the street. It'll drive nice and quiet, but you can also use it year-round in the ice and the snow. Now, our new wheels have also just showed up, and I'm tempted to get this mounted on the truck right away. But we also just installed a new posi and some loud exhaust. So as a car guy, there's one thing that I'm obligated to do first with these old tires. You guys probably know what's coming next because as far as I'm concerned, there's only one way to properly test that all these upgrades have worked. There it goes, she's coming alive. Full tire spinning and the exhaust sounds great. If you guys have any questions about anything you've seen today, be sure to check us out at PowerNationTV.com. This time on Truck Tech, we wrap up a few odds and ends on our retro GMC build. And we couldn't call it a day without getting it out into the dirt to see what she's made of.
The wheel and tire that you choose for your truck is going to set the vibe for the entire build. And for the project that we're working on today, we're going old school. I've got a 33 inch all terrain tire on a 16 inch polished aluminum eight hole wheel. And this just screams mid 90s, which is perfect for our retro or throwback O2 GMC build. Now, I can't wait to get these things on and see how it's going to look, but they're just a little bit too tall. So before we do that, we've got to raise up the front suspension. The simplest way to get a few extra inches of lift to clear larger tires on a pickup truck like this is going to be a leveling kit, and they're quite easy to install. Up front, the lift is going to be achieved with new torsion bar keys, and all they do is reposition the indexing of the torsion bar. Now, because we're going to be raising the front end up, we will need a little bit longer shock, so most kits come with longer shocks as well. Now, you could just lift up the front with a leveling kit, and the front and rear of the truck would be, well, as the name suggests, level. But to me, a raked truck is a little bit cooler, so we're also going to be installing slightly taller than stock lift blocks. Now, the stock blocks are about an inch tall, so this will raise the rear one additional inch, and also to go along with that, new shocks. So let's get this truck up in the air and get to it. With the back tires out of the way, I'll support the rear axle with a pole jack so I can loosen the U-bolts. I'll lower the axle away from the leaf spring and swap the stock block for the new lift block. The longer U-bolts go in, securing the whole thing together. The new rear shocks will finish up the rear end. The stock adjuster bolt comes out, but to remove the block nut, you'll either have to use a heavy-duty two-jaw puller or a torsion bar unloading tool like this. With the stock height key removed, I'll now swap to the longer shock since there's no tension on the suspension. Well, with the hex lined up on the new and the old key, you can see how there's just a slight difference at the end of the arm, but that slight difference is enough to lift the truck. I'll install the new keyway and screw the adjuster bolt in about halfway, but I'll have to fine tune the ride height once the truck is back on the ground. Our red GMC has traveled a quarter of a million miles, so needless to say, there are gonna be some worn out parts. Now, last time I took care of everything in the front suspension. We got new upper and lower control arms, CV axles, wheel bearings, and brakes, but I didn't touch anything in the steering. So that's the next chore that we're gonna tackle today. I selected some Duralast gold chassis parts to refresh the front end, and I picked up an idler arm and support bracket, a pitman arm, some inner and outer tie rod ends, which together should restore the factory steering feel of our GMC. These Duralast Gold chassis parts are engineered and designed with quality in mind, and they're going to last long even in a heavy-duty application. Now, the balls in the joints have a larger surface area than stock for improved load distribution, and the studs are made from hardened steel. So, needless to say, these are some durable parts. And I know that front-end work isn't the most fun thing to do, but as I'm about to show you, it's really not all that bad. In order to remove the tapered seats, which hold most of these parts together, there are a few specific tools you'll need. Most of the basics you'll likely already have, like sockets and wrenches, but to remove the pitman arm from the center link, you'll need some kind of pickle form. And then a specialized puller to get the pitman arm off the steering gear. Depending on what kind of truck you have, you also may need to remove other components out of the way to gain access to what you're working on. It's a breeze to reinstall the new parts because they are direct replacements from the old. To get the wheels relatively straight, I set the length of the new tie rods as close as I could to the old ones. Yay! 
Now, as much as you may dislike doing basic maintenance work like steering and suspension, there's nothing that's going to improve how a 20-year-old truck drives more than a freshly rebuilt front suspension aligned to factory specs. Now, speaking of which, I still need to get the GMC dropped off at the alignment shop, but other than that, we're ready for the big tires. Next, a little trim for new rubber. We've got both the steering and the suspension systems taken care of on our retro GMC build. So we're almost ready to throw on the larger wheels and tires. But I know with this mild lift that we've installed, they're not going to fit right away without just a little bit of modification of the fenders. Now, the stock wheels have a very high positive offset and they have a narrow tire, which means they kind of sucked up in underneath the fender wells. Our new wheels have a high negative offset, which means they're pushed further out. And on top of that, they have a tall and wide tire. So there's two areas that are going to interfere. Number one here is the back of the fender, kind of at the lower rocker. And number two is up front on the lower splash guard and a little bit of this bumper. Now, trimming is kind of a standard practice when it comes to fitting larger wheels and tires onto an older truck. So let's get to it and throw some sparks. On Chevy and GMC trucks from 99 to 07, the lower rear edge of the front fender and front pinch weld on the rocker are the main areas which will interfere with taller and wider tires. But all we need is about an extra inch and a half of clearance. Rather than just chopping the metal away, I like to fold down the front fender and trim away just a little bit. Then fold the pinch weld flat with the rocker to retain most of its strength. Then I can add another fold in the sheet metal part of the fender for a clean look that doesn't have any sharp edges. On the front bumper, I'll trim it back about an inch at a slight angle and then give it a test fit. All right, this is the moment of truth. Let's see if all this effort is worth it. If I get it lined up, that'd be helpful. Now, it might seem a little bit drastic at first to have to cut into the sheet metal of your pickup just to fit a larger set of wheels and tires. But like I said earlier, it is fairly common practice, especially on a GM truck, because the wheel wells are just pretty tight to the tire. Now, one thing to keep in mind, you don't want to cut into the actual framework of your truck. Depending on what model you have, there might be some important structure back here. But on these GM trucks, it's just sheet metal, so there's no safety factor that we're taking away. Now, obviously, the suspension is still drooped out, but when we turn the wheel, you can see there is plenty of clearance on both the front as well as the back. Current star light back there. Um, but when the wheels are turned, there should be no rubbing at all. So the next thing to do is get that back tire on, get the truck on the ground, see how our old school cool Sierra is going to look. With the weight of the truck finally back on the suspension, at first glance, it appears that the front end is sitting just a little bit too high. And according to the tape measure, it's about an inch higher than it is in the rear, which isn't going to fly. We don't have enough up travel of the suspension. So all I've got to do is decrank the adjuster bolts for the torsion bars a few turns. We'll lower this thing down so it's level or maybe about three quarters of an inch lower in the front. I really like how that looks. I'm digging the stance with the new wheels and tires. So now it's time to do some work under the hood to give this truck a little more scoot. You can sort of think of our GMC as a bit of a budget build. You haven't seen us throw on any mega dollar forged 22 inch wheels, coilover suspension conversions, or anything like that. Most of the parts that we have are reasonably affordable, and the same is going to hold true for the parts that increase the performance. Now, there are three main ways which you can increase the horsepower of your truck without spending a ton of money. And the first we've already taken care of. We did long tube headers and a free-flowing exhaust a couple weeks back. So today, we're going to take care of the remaining two 
intake and calibration. I went to Summit Racing and I picked up a Banks Ram Air cold air intake. And this air box is going to flow substantially more air than the stock setup. But most importantly, it's a true cold air intake, which means the filter is isolated in this box from the heat of the engine bay, so it's only going to draw in cool outside air. Now, the majority of our power gains today are going to come from this SCT X4 programmer. Now, this will come with some preloaded tunes, but I have a custom tune on here that's been designed to accommodate the larger than stock tires, so our speedometer and shift points will be corrected, as well as the long tube headers. And finally, I've got some ignition tune up parts from MSD. Now, these aren't necessarily going to increase the performance, but new plugs and wires are going to make sure that the fuel that's being introduced into our engine is going to properly be combusted. So, we'll get started by taking out the old stock parts. The stock intake tube and air box is easily removed from the Sierra, which gives us a little extra room to pull out the stock plug wires and the spark plugs. The new MSD plugs bolt right in and the superconductor wires finish up the ignition upgrade. The bank's intake box bolts onto the fender, and with the lid in place, the mass airflow sensor slides in, and the intake tube connects the engine to the airbox. Later on, some old school wheeling. It's no secret that you can increase the performance of your fuel injected engine simply by changing around the calibration inside the computer. But how exactly does a device like the SCT X4 increase performance? And the best comparison that I could make is to an old school carbureted engine. You see, back in the day, if you wanted more power, you could simply turn the distributor to advance the timing, or you could mess around with a carburetor to change the air fuel ratio. And the same exact thing is happening here, except electronically. We're changing around ignition timing, we're changing the fuel mixture, RPM at which the transmission shifts, how it goes into power enrichment mode, and a whole bunch of other parameters, which will work perfectly together with the mechanical parts that we've changed, like a cold air intake, long tube headers, and free flowing exhaust. So altogether, we should have a nice upgrade in horsepower to our 5.3. So the only thing we have left to do is get this thing out on the road and see how it all works together. Next, we put our tires to the test. Now obviously the first thing that you're going to notice about this truck from the outside are the changes that we made to its visual appearance. We wanted to give it a retro look. I think we nailed it. We've got the chrome roll bar in the bed with the four KC highlights on top and the 16 inch wheels with the 33 inch tires. It just really, really nails that look. Now, speaking of the tires, I am very impressed with how these General Grabber ATXs are performing on the road. But when we get these things off-road in the dirt, that's where they really begin to shine. Just because a pickup like this is probably going to spend most of its life driving down the highway, there's no reason we can't get it off the road. And that's the only place I could think of to properly test it. So we came out to Woolies Off-Road Park in Linville, Tennessee. Now we come here for a lot of our payoffs, honestly, because it has such a nice variety of terrain. It has some extreme stuff, but it also has some more mild trails and open fields for a truck just like this. So we're gonna put it to the test. We knew that we wanted to run General Grabber off-road tires on our retro GMC build, but when you boil it down, there are really two tires that we had to choose from. On Class EK5, we ran Grabber X3s, which are a mud terrain tire, because we knew we were going to be getting into some nasty conditions. On the other hand, the ATX is General's all-terrain offering. I spoke with Travis Roffler, Director of Marketing, and he helped us decide on the right tire for our application. Well, anytime the conditions get severe, you know, we talk X3 is for rock, sand, and mud. So when we when we talk about conditions that are very intense, whether it's deep mud, deep sand, hard rock, big rock, if you're looking for a tire that's going to give you good off-road conditions in not, a, I will say, milder conditions of off-road, whether it's rock, whether it's sand, or whether it's mud, but you're still looking for on-road manners, quiet, comfortable ride because the ATX is built with a two-ply casing versus the X3 with the three-ply casing. So durability-wise, the X3 is going to give you a little bit more durability than the ATX would. 
One of the other things that we did with both tires, is you can see, if you look at the tire, we extended the actual pattern down into the shoulder of the tire. So in those air down conditions, when the tire is twisted on its side, it gives you not only extra grip and traction to pull up those rocks, pull through that mud in those air down conditions, but also allows you robustness and, and puncture resistance in that off shoulder with that thicker off shoulder to protect the tire uh, in severe conditions. The 99 to 07 full size Chevy is probably one of the most popular used trucks right now. And I think this is why, because you can do so many different things with it, whether it's daily driving, off roading, weekend warrior, or what have you. you go to racing, or driving to the mall. I know I've said this before, but I'm gonna say it again. I love how this truck sounds. You get a 5.3 V8, long tube headers, Flowmaster exhaust. It just has an unmistakable rumble that you can't beat, you can't go wrong with it. When it's coming up the trail, it just has a really cool sound. There we go, come on. Oh, effortless, effortless. A little bumpy. Oh, don't mind the scratches on the paint. Walking right up. Oh yeah. So when I'm sitting at the bottom of the hill, kind of staring up and I see that big rut at the bottom, it's pretty intimidating. But honestly, this truck crawled right up. I mean, it's probably got a couple of scratches on the roof from those branches, but not a big deal. That's off-roading. I am impressed with how these ATX all-terrain tires are doing. And honestly, this is exactly the terrain that they're designed for. You got loose dirt, some rocks, a little bit of mud. I've never broken traction once. I mean, I'm really not trying to go nuts here, but the tires, they clean themselves out, the mud spins out so the treads stay open, and they've done everything I've asked them to. Now, obviously, we are gonna put it to the test and try to find a little bit more extreme terrain. So far, so good. The one thing I was worried about, them rubbing, I haven't heard a single bit yet. Especially when you turn, you kind of go over a bump and the wheels get stuffed up in. That's where you're gonna rub and that's where you're gonna have problems. But right now, we didn't have to trim a whole lot. There's no rubbing, so I think we're golden. If you guys liked what you saw today or if you have any more questions about this build, be sure to check us out at powernationtv.com.